Okay, looks like we're live. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the new year uh, and to the Colors in World Building discussion. Uh, I've got the lovely Karen Rochnick and Linda Pfeiffer with me today. Thanks for coming, you guys. I hope we'll have a few more people pop in over the course of the discussion, but we'll just have to see. Anyway, um, yay. Excellent. Uh, so colors, let's talk about colors. And we'll try to figure out if Mr. Sullivan can be heard and seen in a second. Um, I don't see color work done a lot. I mean, I've seen, so OK, so let's be clear. It's not that I don't see color work done at all in world building, but mostly I see uh, people doing a thing where, you know, they're using another, they're using another culture, for example. And so there will be a sort of a color component that comes in with that culture. And I'm thinking specifically um, of Aliette de Baudin's work where she does Asian uh, inspired, you know, Vietnamese and Chinese inspired cultures. Um, and so the color values that appear in those works are typically associated with um, the culture. Uh, that she is working in. And that's great because that means she's incorporating colors. Because color is a very powerful uh, form of communication. And I'm still not hearing uh, Mr. Sullivan. So I want to. Mr. Sullivan, I'm wondering if you are muted for some reason. Can you check your toolbar at the top and maybe unmute your microphone? Juliet, check the chat window. Oh, no, camera mic. OK, thank you. Thank you. It's nice to have you here anyway. <laughs> That's OK. That's OK. No worries. Um, we've had people uh, We've had people on here from uh, no camera or microphone locations before. So I will keep my eye on the chat bar if you would like to contribute something. OK? Hi, Cliff. Welcome. Hi. Took me a while to. I have a new computer. I had to figure out how to get this thing working on it. Wow, you've got an interesting <laughs> background today. Yeah, it's uh, my wife's study, actually. Me? Oh. She, she did. She did the decorating. So, um, you want to tell me a little about the colors behind you? <laughs> oh well, yeah. That's there's blue over there, <laughs> and uh, it it has the chief advantage of being upstairs while the twins are downstairs, unlike my office. So. Oh, I see, uh, I see. Um, so I had just been talking about color sort of culture sets. Um, color culture sets. That sounds like a Photoshop thing. <laughs> yeah, it does sort of, actually. Um, but what I'm thinking about is, in particular, the way that if we have a particular culture that we're using in the context of a story, that the value of colors within that culture will tend to be imported along with the use of that color. I mean, that culture. Mm. So, like, like royal if you're purple, taking an Asian, uh, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're taking a Japanese environment, then particular colors have particular emotional values within that context that are not necessarily the same as the emotional values that the colors would have in an American context. And so you might find the like color pink. values local to the culture being used in a story like that. Sure. But if you're writing for Americans, you have a problem. Not necessarily. You have I mean, a problem. It might not be an insurmountable problem, but you. But all the reader brings, you know, each reader brings their, their own experience and their own associations with all the language. Mm-hmm. Right? So... Uh, for example, if you have somebody enter the room, you know, wearing lavender, then people are going to have associations with that based on American culture. If they're wearing black, you know, that's that's a different kind of association. Um, certainly, in Asian cultures, the meaning of white is very different in clothing, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So yeah. you always have to deal with that if you're if you're showing. Uh, say an American wedding through the eyes of somebody who just got off the boat from China, 
right? And the bride's wearing white. Right. Well, how's the character going to react to that? Well, how do you think they would react to that? That depends on whether they've watched TV. <laughs> <laughs> they already American memes are already pretty prevalent around the world. Yeah. A hundred right. years ago, if you're setting it in 1900, you know maybe they'll freak out because it's a color for funerals, right? Yeah. Uh, Zelazny did an interesting thing with that, actually, in um, the the tenth Amber novel. So you have to read the mm -hmm. first time to get there. Uh, he had a funeral in the courts of chaos, and red was the funeral color in chaos. And he just he just had the the narrative, first person narrative, just tell the reader, you know, it's the color of blood, the color of death, the funeral colors. You know, you just boom, you're done. Mm -hmm. Right, world building in a in a, a small adjectival phrase. <laughs> so. Yeah. It's very well, good so, at that, okay. this compact world building thing. I, I see your point with, with saying that you have a problem when there is uh, when there is a different set of emotional associations with colors. Yeah. But I don't think it's a uh, I'm not going to call it a problem. Uh, I'll call it a task. Right? Because as an author, one of the things that you have to do is you have to establish the emotional associations of things that happen in the story. Sure. And so let's say that you were working in a complete secondary world and you had a set of color emotional values that was not familiar to your reader, and of course it would not be familiar. So you would have to provide information in the text that would support the emotional value of a particular color. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it's not hard to say that, you know, give the impression that your character is um, saddened by the color yellow because it's the color of the moon and the moon is the goddess who comes down and takes your spirit up when you've been a good boy and you've died, right? right. Sure. Um, so, I mean, but, I, I'm using that as an example. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but that's the task. But the problem is that the reader already associates happiness with yellow, right? right. Well, so, so are they willing maybe to something else. belief and go with the author or not? But that's, yeah. a, that's a reading problem. That's not an author mm. problem. You know, managing the reader's emotional investment to the best of our ability is, is part of the task, right? Right, absolutely. You want to you want to you want to kind of merge when the reader brings their associations and you have your world and you you want them you want them to understand one another. Mm -hmm. You want them to feel that understanding, not just intellectually know. Well, mm -hmm. in this world, color me you know the color yellow is sorrow, so I'm going to remember that as a reader. That's different from feeling sad at the funeral when everyone's wearing yellow at the end of the story. Right, but you can actually establish that. You can, but it's you know the, <laughs> the the problem you have is the is what the reader brings is you know maybe opposite what you need to establish. That's, That's all possible. I'm saying. Yeah, That's no, why I'm, I use the word I'm problem. We can use the word task. Yeah, it's it's value neutral. Interesting task. So so I guess the question then becomes: Is it worth putting some effort into trying to change people's associations with? with colors. And I personally think that it is because um, I think it's a really kind of a fun way to break people out of their normal uh, sense of the world and make them feel like they're really in a different place from you know, the place that they usually inhabit. I, th I think Cliff in some ways too, and this is uh, Chandra, um, I think in some ways, too, we have to take into account that readers are bringing things with them from microcultures. So mm -hmm. if I were to write a novel that is set partic you know, very strongly for Western Christian culture, I'm going to yeah. use the color white as an example. White in Western Christian culture is the sign of purity and very strongly associated with weddings, very strongly associated with cleanliness. However, if you are a Japanese raised person, white is the color of death, if I recall correctly. Yes. Uh, actually, so, um, mm, uh, it's a little more complicated than that in Japan. Okay. 
That, that's that's fair. If you want to elaborate China. on that, feel free. But but my point is is that if if we're still writing one book from one particular perspective, we have to, as writers, we have to take into account that there are other cultural differences that are there in readers to begin with. Right. So in terms of being willing to change colors and change definitions of colors, as long as the associations are strong, because we're already having to write to a very multicultural audience anyway, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's, there's nothing lost by doing that as long as it has plot significance or world, world building significance. You have a good if point. It's just one of, if, if it's just one of those things where you're just flippantly doing it to do it, then, then yes, I wholeheartedly agree with you. It's like, why did you bother doing that? You inserted this color for no purpose, and it's just sitting there and doing nothing. It's not adding to your book. It's not adding to your world. It's not improving the depth of your characters. But if you do it with the conscious intention of building a full culture, of building a full world, of building a full history, and the reasons why these things are, and this mythos and, and doctrine and practice and ritual, whether it's religious or social or, or not, or even magical, which could fall into the other two categories. That's the important part, is, is why, why are you doing those things? And as long as the reasons, I would argue, are not just, oh, well, because I can, you know, and, and because it serves no purpose other than to entertain me, but it actually serves a backing purpose, then I think that's, that's, when, that's when it becomes good. But I, well, I'm sorry, I've said wait on to something else. I can. <laughs> well, so, to tell um, a story, <laughs> I think I think there are tons of possible purposes. Um, I think there's a lot you can do with color in terms of, you know, symbolism, and uh, uh, drawing associations across the book with different kinds of emotional states. And it's a great thing to put in the background. Um, and I'm thinking uh, this is not a book but a film. Um, that got discussed on my wall recently, the, the movie Hero, does some amazing things with color that vastly change the impression, uh, the emotional impression of different scenes. And in fact, it's, it's quite surreal the way that they use color in that, in that movie. You know, you've got this entire scene where everything's red and then there's, you know, <laughs> and then everything's white. And, then, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I found it fascinating to look at, for one thing, but also um, I think that it, it it can be very striking or it can be very subtle, and it just depends on how you want to do it, really. But I think there's there's a lot of potential there for, for magnifying the impression of a story. Um, and I wanted to say a little bit about, about what I know about the color white in Japan. Uh, white is the color of the Shinto bride uh, kimono, and it's the color of wedding ties there. So, and I and it is also a color associated with purity, um, and I suppose cleanliness, but it's also a color associated with masculinity um, in Japan. So basically the associations are kind of the same, but kind of not, um, which in, in some sense makes it even more fun. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, the, the 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 image of like white cranes embroidered on a white kimono or a white tie that is a very uh, wedding thing and then the the, the masculinity um, uh, aspect of it they have uh, for example in, in New Year's they have this television song competition <laughs> uh, it, it's sort of odd anyway. Uh, but the colors that you associate with the New Year's are red and white. And white is the masculine, and red is the feminine. And so the singers in this competition are divided into two teams, the white team, which is all the boys, and the red team, which is all the girls. Uh, and you also have, for example, the, the New Year's food has a lot of red and white in it. 
So you'll have pickled daikon, which is the white, and you'll have pickled carrots, which is the red, and they get, you know, cut into shapes and all this kind of complicated stuff. Uh, but so that red and white is is a little bit like a yin yang thing uh, when it's associated with news. And you know, this is the kind of stuff that I find absolutely fascinating. So, um, yeah, and 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 I think and I think that the association of red with with femininity is actually very um, uh, connected with menstruation. You know, back at the root of it, even though people probably don't think about that actively when they associate colors with with gender, but. Um, but for example, uh, young women will often wear kimono with bright red as one of the colors, if not the major color of the kimono, because it it is a sort of a symbol of the you know youthful, youthful girl, feminine kind of uh, feeling. So, anyway, so that was that's what I know about <laughs> colors in Japan. Which brings up the thought that you don't if you're especially in a secondary world, you don't want to just say, okay, well, yellow is in this culture what white is in Western our culture. Right, right, good point. Because the categories divide up differently. Uh-huh. Uh, so while, so to use your example earlier, of yellow being associated with funerals and death, mm -hmm. It, it could also have some other association that wouldn't connect to what white is in or Western black culture is, yeah. at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, the um, in the in the in the case of my uh, choice of yellow black, for uh, the Varan world, uh, it's a particular color of yellow. Um, it's it's not it's not you know buttercup yellow. <laughs> uh, uh, it's in fact this sort of very um, almost off white yellow. It's a sort of moon color, uh, but they call it yellow. I mean, as as we know, uh, there's a whole world of colors out there, and and the words that we use are actually much much simpler, except when you go into say fashion or paint colors. Though that is an entire discussion in and of itself. Um, yeah, so now, now I, I'll just colors. add in. Sorry, what were you saying? Oh, sorry, I was just, I was just going to say I was going to add in really quickly, um, and of course these sor these sources are questionable because it's the internet, right? But apparently Egypt and Burma both have yellow as the color of mourning. So oh, I was just doing I was doing a quick search on on color meanings in different cultures, and so I just happened to stumble over that. So I guess that's that's a good example since the white one didn't quite pan out for me. <laughs> Where in Western? Oh no, it's, actually, it was uh, uh, Cliff was the one who was mentioning that in China that it was associated with death at a certain period. Um, oh, okay. Except if you know if you're a modern person and you've watched a lot of Western TV, then you might have loosened your association with that uh, a little bit from its oh, fair original enough. Yeah. value. But yes, I don't think you were wrong. I think it was just, you know, uh, China instead of Japan. Um, that's okay. Well, we, we well, there's a lot of cross-cultural between China and Japan. I, a absolutely a ton. <laughs> yeah. Can I uh, just jump in with a couple of thoughts that are will probably completely throw the discussion in a random direction? Nice. Um, random directions one, are great. One is a memory of uh, the Hunger Games, one of the more powerful scenes was when um, the protagonist Katniss and the male tribute she's stuck with, uh, Peta, are having a conversation and they're trying to get to know one another because they're kind of a team. And she asks him what his favorite color is and he says orange. And she's like, orange? And he's like, yeah, but not like bright orange, like a sunset. Mm -hmm. And that, that was a really good use of establishing mood. I mean, the idea of a sunset, first of all, is mellow, but it's also like end and death, and it has those kinds of associations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which she wanted, I think, because that was on the eve of the games, if I remember yeah. correctly. So, so she wanted to get that, uh, when I say she, Suzanne Collins, uh, wanted to get, I think, that emotion into the reader and was using color specifically. And it was, you know, set in North America, but in a made-up culture. 
Right. Um, so that's one thought. But the other thought that I have, since we're world building, and that doesn't just mean the people who live in a world, but the world itself. Yes. Uh, in science fiction and, and in secondary worlds and fantasy, you can make up a color scheme. I just sold a story uh, in which the characters go to a parallel world in which the sky is is like chalk white and the sun is this kind of like bright white thing in it and all the people mm -hmm. have you know like ivory skin and white hair and it's, it's like it's as if the colors had been bleached out of this world and that's part of mm -hmm. what I, I was trying to get across was that that something was sucking the life out of this this place so I, I just bleached everything and I used the <laughs> physical yeah like you know and yeah. the leaves are still green on the trees, but but you know you wondered for how long maybe. And at at one point, there's even a a bunch of dogwoods, and I picked that specifically because they have white bark. Mm -hmm. so, and, um, so I was trying to get across white the flowers sense, too. You know. Well, and well, if you, you're talking science fiction, then if you're dealing with an alien race, their visual perception. Mm -hmm could lead to a completely different set of colors. Yeah, if they see in the infrared or the ultraviolet. Yeah, I was actually yeah, just about so, to suggest, okay, so. uh, you know, from the Star Trek universe, the Klingons actually, you'll notice that all the, all the lighting on Klingon ships is all red-toned, and uh -huh. most of their hues tend to be in the greens and reds, whereas humans are in the, the blues. Well, that's because, supposedly, according to... Uh, the way the universe works, right, basically as, as um, the science people or the can canon people in Star Trek said, Klingons perceive reds, and reds are more beautiful to them than blues are. And actually, if you listen throughout a lot of the episodes and the movies, you can hear them talk about all of those color differences and how, you know, ugly the colors, the colors look. <laughs> That's fascinating. Okay, so I have, yeah. actually have two things to say about that. Um... One is the question of whether uh, whether a an alien race would have a different perception of color, for example, perceiving more colors than we are aware of. Uh, if you're fewer. going to be doing alien point of view there, I think that it's uh, something that you would have to manage linguistically in a very particular strategic way. This is not something that you'd want to sort of say, I'm going to wave my hands and say that they perceive more colors, but I'm not going to have them talk about them or have special words for them, right? Um, you'd want to make sure that that aliens who perceive more colors would have words for them. And uh, hi, Harry. Hi, um. <laughs> uh, so I just said aliens who ha perceive more colors would have words for them. And also the other thing that I wanted to say was, uh, sorry, I'm just writing this down. Uh, uh, that you don't actually have to perceive other colors to have different words for them and to be more attentive to them. For example, uh, and Harry might be able to speak to this Russian. I don't know how much Russian you know, Harry, if any. But uh, uh, no, Russian no, no, has no, no. several words for blue t blue tones. Yes, so, I so uh, there have been actually uh, some studies done by the folks. I think that um, they're the folks who are, are working with how language affects perception and psychology that basically um, you learn to categorize things and, and perceive things that are called out and important in your language. And therefore, um, Russian speakers are able to distinguish between six different shades of blue, for example. I don't, uh, don't quote me on the number six. However, uh, they perceive more different shades of blue because they're separate vocabulary words for those different shades of blue in Russian and that is not a question of you know the the sensorium the visual cortex of the brain or anything like that it's a language question so those were the two things that I wanted to add yeah I, one of those I've always heard but can't cite a source there's a tribe somewhere that their color 
they really only have two words for color, which more or less boil down to green and not green. Ah, the green and not green thing is not one that I have heard. However, uh, overall, there's a linguistic pattern across the world that uh, that says uh, how color words are going to appear, and this has to do with the sensorium. And I'm glad you brought it up. Um, uh, and and it basically boils down to this: if the language has two color words, they are going to be, generally speaking, I see this is why I don't know about the late green and not green thing, they're generally going to be light and dark. Um, and if they're going to be three words for colors, they're going to be white and light and dark and red. And then if they're going to be five words for colors, they will be Light and white and black and red and blue and green and it, it there's a very it, it's it's interesting right De, but you can have a very simple color categorization system or you can have a very complex one but over at the simple end there's actually a very systematic way that languages will categorize colors and it and for some reason this pattern of light versus dark, then red, then blue and green, then other kinds of things starting to come in in a little bit more of a unpredictable pattern, right? Um, but that has to do with how human eyes and human brains perceive color uh, because it's a pattern that is seen, you know, all through the world pretty much. Um, there's a, if it's four words, there's a blue-green word that covers both blue and green. Oh, uh, right, okay. But uh, if you look at like even older English texts, like if, uh, like an Anglo-Saxon, if you look at Beowulf, at that time mm -hmm. period, uh, the metal gold was described as red, and they mm. weren't being poetic; they were just that's the color of gold, red gold. Um, gold was red in Beowulf. Okay, awesome. In, you know, One thousand years ago. Um. There, yeah. So you know. There's, the gold being red thing uh, makes me think of the fact that that traffic lights in Japan are described as blue. Um, that the color that we call blue is really not quite the same as the color that the Japanese describe as aoi because aoi is kind of blue green, and the sea is aoi, but that doesn't mean it's blue. If you notice. <laughs> well, in you know, in American English, traffic lights, the middle one is called yellow and it's called amber in the UK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to my eyes it always looked more amber. Like it didn't look yellow at all. It still mm -hmm. does. So you can certainly change one word or two, you know just for flavor <laughs> if you don't want to invest in altering your entire color system and and, and values of things. Um, okay, so, so now I want to talk a little bit about um, emotional values of colors um, as opposed to, for example, the associating a color with a specific social context like funerals or you know uh, that kind of thing uh, we talk about hot and cold colors in English is that something that you any of you know about and what how that works in other languages are colors described as hot and cold in other places in the world well I know them as warm and um, warm and cold Not hot and cold, mm -hmm. but it's very much the same in Bulgarian as well. And does that well. happen in, in uh, like Bulgarian as well, Harry? Yeah, yeah. We kind of like bundle the oranges, the reds, and the yellows together and call them, you know, warm colors. And then there are the blues and the greens, mm -hmm. which are, and the violet, purple, and those are our um, cold colors. Mm hmm. Okay. 
Uh, not very different. Not very different not from yeah. the West. So it sounds yeah, it sounds uh, similar. Um, it makes me think of uh, the, the the symbolic uh, atmospheric, I guess you'll call it atmospheric function of having colors in the environment when you're writing a scene. Um, yeah. You can create an atmosphere of something by by giving it a cold color, right? If everything around yep. is bleached, as Cliff was describing from his story, or or if everything is blue, then uh, you know, given the given the diverse reader uh, body that Chandra mentioned before, you're not going to get a uniformly specific reaction to that. However, um, I do think that authors sometimes will try to create a specific atmosphere, like a clinical atmosphere by having everything be light gray. So people will associate it with, say, office buildings or hospitals, right? Or um, uh, uh, having everything... Well, you guys remember... Um, I don't know if you guys ever saw the uh, materials that accompanied the, the movie The Matrix. One of the things that they did that was very interesting in that movie was whenever you were inside the Matrix, everything was in colors of green. Yeah, I love that. And so things that were black weren't really black. They were actually blackish green. And things that were white weren't really white. They were kind of whitish green. <laughs> and so they had a sort of a green color theme throughout everything that was in the Matrix and then much more of a blue and white color theme for everything that happened outside of it, at least in the first film. I mean, when once you get to Zion, you're getting a lot more yellow and brown and that kind of thing, which is great. Um, but I remember them talking specifically about having made sure that the Matrix environment was tinged green. Yeah, that's, that's commonly in movies because the color is right there, right? So mm -hmm. uh, I saw a making of uh, Oh Brother Where Art Thou where they taught, they showed like before and after they color coded everything they sort of bleached everything out to try and yeah. give a kind they of they sort of made color. everything sepia right yeah 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 to give it that old feeling and also the feeling of you know the the drought from the 30s um, and then you mm -hmm. see that where they were filming this lush green you know beautiful environment <laughs> um, yeah and very very different. And then another fascinating use of color is in the movie Pitch Black, mm -hmm. where there's a planet with, with three different suns, and at one point there's like a bluish sun and a reddish sun, and they change the lighting depending on which one is in the sky. Oh, that's and interesting. Different scenes are lit all bluish or all reddish because that particular sun is supposed to be up. That's interesting. interesting. I mean, because I would imagine that if you were part of that society, you might perceive the change, but on a, probably on a subconscious level, whereas humans watching the story would, would perceive it on a more conscious level, or maybe they might not. I think a lot of it is to, to try and have a, a movie audience perceive things unconsciously. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, and, and sometimes a filmmaker will establish a vocabulary of color, like in The Matrix. Mm -hmm. The audience doesn't bring green and computers. I mean, old-style VT100 monitors were either tinted amber or green because that's easy on the eyes, yeah, yeah. which is a physical thing. So they just took that green and they ran with it. But that doesn't mean <laughs> that, you know, the literally, right? I mean, the, the, yes. the, stuff in the matrix is that is that VT100 green. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, that doesn't mean the audience comes in with the association of that. The audience may never have seen that kind of a terminal. That's true. You no, know, um, most of them have. But I mean, I think so it also serves to establish professional. that if they haven't. Yeah, they they the filmmaker has to establish a visual language, and it doesn't ever have to be conscious, right? the 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 audience mm -hmm. can know mm -hmm. they're in the Matrix without knowing why they know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to remark vis-a-vis um, -vis your your question of well whether the person had ever seen the green uh, the green screen effect 
before and you know oh well they're going to do that whether or not they've seen it before but this is sort of like um, you're talking about vocabulary of color this is exactly what language acquisition is like right when I mean, you hear a word for the first time it definitely has a meaning and an association but you just haven't learned it yet right and so you know maybe yeah. maybe people aren't bringing that green screen association in with them but if they aren't, then they might learn it during the course of the film. I mean, we learn so early, for example, another thing that we learn subconsciously, and this is not color, so we'll not spend a lot of time on it, but the association of particular music with suspense or with sadness or this kind of thing, you know, the orchestral effect that it creates. Like, how does that pattern get established? Well, it gets established through the associations for people who you know might not have learned that association yet it's it's not going to be something that they necessarily bring with them but it will be something that they can carry forward um, yeah and I think that that's exactly the same thing that we're doing when we're talking about establishing a, an alternate color system or an alternate color value system within a secondary world or or you know an unfamiliar non-American culture, right, is that some people will come in with values that have to be changed, but everybody on some level has the ability to perceive associations. And by the time you've made the association three times, because three is usually the magic number, then, uh, then they will say, this is a pattern and I'm going to watch for it. Even if they're saying that in, in their subconscious, right? Um, so you can teach those associations in text as well as in movie uh, format. Sure. There is there is one other thing I would like to uh, point out about color and movie specifically, mm -hmm. um, and um, the the one that always kind of got me was the movie Sin City. Mm hmm. Um, which is, of course, based off of, if I recall correctly, graphic novels. So, mm -hmm. any of you who are fans of the graphic novel, please forgive me. Um, yeah. I've only seen the movie. Okay. Um, but, but the one story, there's one story towards the end where it has Bruce Willis and this little girl that he rescues. And the villain is yellow. And everything else is black and white. Huh. And that's definitely one of the more interesting uses of color... Um, and to expand on color a little bit, there are also several scenes early on in the movie where they use light in a very particular way. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I cite that is because a lot of the movie is in grayscale tones. And so mm -hmm. the only way they can show certain emotions is not necessarily by using color, but by using light to either desaturate things or saturate things or change the tone or change the hue of a specific mm -hmm. tone of gray. <clears throat> yeah. So that's that's probably something else to take into account too. Is uh, even if your your even if color doesn't have a meaning, let's say that you do you create a people who they don't see in color. Right. Like I think Cliff, you were saying earlier, uh, where you have um, where basically you, you have someone who perceives an infrared. Mm hmm Or using only low light. So, you know, how does that change the perception of color? You know, what what else would impact that, etc. But I thought that was a very, very particular and very interesting use of color, and it was just the the villain was was always yellow, and you learn why later on, but it's still neat. Yeah, there's a scene in a Schindler's List like that where the um, everything's in black and white to evoke, literally to evoke the newsreel footage of the freeing of the concentration camps, which was in black and white. Uh, except for one little girl uh, who has a red coat. The girl, yeah, the girl in red. You know, and that's obviously designed to draw the eye, right? It's halfway through the film, and, you know, so you know what her fate is. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and of course there's The Wizard of Oz, right? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, which was back when color movies were really not a thing yet and just to surprise the heck out of the audience. With I'm that. really glad you brought that up, Cliff. And the Yellow Brick Road has 
symbolism and people say, oh, he's talking about the gold standard or whatever, you know, I mean, it's... <laughs> yeah, my, right. my American history teacher had this whole elaborate thing that he went through about the, the Gilded Age and the Wizard of Oz and the, all the symbolism and stuff. <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, so... Uh, and the Emerald City, which not in the movie but in the book, is emerald because all citizens are issued green-colored glasses. Mm -hmm. right. So, so they don't see the squalor yeah. because of the color, because they're they're like wearing emerald yeah. glasses. Yes, though I would wonder actually. I mean, you sort of stop perceiving. You sort of stop perceiving things when you're wearing glasses with a color, right? You stop sort of perceiving that color, and then when you're and then when you take them off, you kind of everything looks weird, <laughs> right? So is that yeah, I always wondered about that. Yeah, I had a actually when I was a kid, I had a pop up book of the Wizard of Oz based on the novel that came with a pair of green glasses. Oh, you cute! Put the book with the green glasses on or off, and you would see different things depending on, especially in the Emerald City, but not just in the Emerald City. You know, things would appear that were designed to not appear without the glasses because the saturation levels were the same. Oh, that's interesting. Very clever. Yeah. Huh. That's interesting, and it's it's a sort of a breaking the breaking the the fourth wall uh, effect with a book. That's kind yeah. of fun. Very well, meta. No, pop up book <laughs> pops up, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, let's see. We've done lots uh, already today. Do we have uh, more things that we need to bring up? Um, I'm only asking because I have some place I need to go at about noon. And if we are at a lull spot this close to noon, perhaps we should uh, draw to a close. So, any last thoughts? There's something that we. <laughs> there's something that terribly important that we've missed. <laughs> Always, always. Um, no, there's make, always something, right? There's always something. But um, can I make two quick comments? Sure. I know, I know I've talked a lot, but um, there's a book that I read in college called *In Praise of Shadows*. Oh, okay. Uh, by Junichiro Tanizaki. Yes. Um, and significantly, the first—it's an essay. It's an essay about Japanese culture, and. Uh -huh. Uh, what he liked about Japanese culture at the time that he wrote it, which according to Wikipedia was 1933. Um, and the first chapter is on bathrooms. And he, com he contrasts the western white gleaming sterile bathroom with the shadowy Japanese bathroom. Mm. And says that the shadows evoke a level of comfort you know, I mean, it's, it's it would seem odd for an American to start an essay collection talking about you know the proper, but that's what he does. And, <laughs> and, uh, it's uh, it's fascinating, just even just to read that first essay and think yeah, about yeah, color. Yeah. And the other thing is, I found a Wikipedia page called "Color in Chinese Culture" that has oh, a chart mapping the five elements in Chinese, um, you know, alchemy to but different colors and different associations. Bar? Pretty cool. Put the URL in the chat bar for me. Um, can I do what? Put the URL in the chat bar for me. I have no idea how to do that. Uh, <laughs> okay. It's on the, uh, uh, on the color in, in Chinese culture. Wikipedia.org slash wiki slash color in Chinese culture. You know. Um, it, okay. If you Google well, color in Chinese culture, it should be the first hit. For future reference, yes. the the the. Control bar that will get you chat is on the left hand side of your window and it, it's at the top. There's okay. a little dialog box at the top. I believe you. I don't know. Uh, you how. believe me. I All barely right. got no, this thing working. You know, that's now. why I was Thanks, on the <laughs> I'm not asking you to do it now, but just for future reference. Anyway, so uh, thank you all for coming. This was really fun. Uh, and I can't remember what we're doing next week. Oh, misunderstandings which should be really fun, and I hope that I can see some of you there. Thank you for everybody being here. It's like a big party. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love having so many people. Anyway, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to stop the broadcast, but you can stay on afterwards if you have other things that you need to say.
stopping broadcast now.